stuff. It's just, we've been so busy, hasn't really, you know, become a priority to <laughs> figure it all well, out you, yet. So, well, yeah. you have had uh, something kind of big happen in your lives. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, get a, you, you get a pass, right? Yeah. At least, at least for the first couple, yeah. first couple of years, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't take us that long. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it'll, it'll, it'll evolve, which is great. It'll change. Yeah. So is, uh, is he sleeping now? Yeah. Do you, I believe you, we're you think we're all live on everything? All live. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. So I should start then. Yes. Yeah. I okay. I think everything is up. Hi, I'm Tira Mitchell from engraver.com. And today I'm going to be speaking with Matt and Lauren Tuggle of Tuggle Designs. And Matt is a wonderful jeweler, fabricator, setter, and Lauren is an engraver. So welcome, Matt and Lauren. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for having us. <laughs> now, where in, um, where in the US are you located? Uh, we're just outside of Denver. So in a town called Westminster, it's like 15 minutes outside of Denver. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So a lot of, a lot of uh, outdoor activities out there, I'm assuming. Yeah. And we're hiking. about like 30 minutes from the mountains and 15 minutes from the city. So we got kind of both of, both of those worlds right next to us. Everybody loves to move to Colorado <laughs> for all of our outdoor activities. And yeah. during the winter, Matt and I love to go snowboarding. So we're usually up there as many days as we can get on the mountain. Um, this this season it was a little bit cut short because of everything going on but you know we're already looking forward to next season okay great um now you you are in business together you do uh custom jewelry right would you like to tell us a little bit about what your business is and how that has kind of come to be yeah. so matt and i started our business uh well started our business on the side probably six years ago while we were working full-time jobs and um, in 2016 we finally launched Tuggle Designs and um, basically it's mostly custom jewelry where we work directly with clients in order to bring their dreams to life um, and then we also do shows uh, locally right now but we're looking at doing one's national shows coming up soon and with those we actually create our own jewelry to sell directly to the public. So most of what we do is custom and some of it happens to be like more of our stock inventory. Yeah. Okay, so you, you have a couple of lines then or a couple of things that you repeat, but mostly it's custom. I mean, I would say even our line of jewelry, everything is unique. We don't really like to make the same thing twice. Uh, it keeps it fun and interesting for us. And then also our clients get a unique one of a kind piece every time. So it's always, everything's always a little bit different. There may be like similarities or a run of a few things that are, you know, similar, but for the most part, we like to keep everything kind of fresh and unique. Yeah. Okay. And so if you have a client, how does that process work for between you and the client and how does that piece come to life? Yeah, I mean, first we start with, you know, sketches. Um, let's say it's a it's a ring or, or whatever, a pendant. Let's just use a ring, for example. Um, yeah, I think, we'll start I think with, you sent us some pictures, too. We can put that up if you, yeah, if you want to yeah. talk about that. Yeah, okay. um, first we start with, like, a, a, a straight down for a view of the ring. Um, so I should have one photo that has um, some dragonfly drawings on it, and there's you know, eight or so drawings on the page. Um, and I'll, I'll start, you know, a client will come to me with like, I want a dragonfly inspired ring. And so I'll, I'll draw up five to eight designs. Um, this is actually one of the finished designs. If you go to one of the other ones, um, you know, first I'll draw just the top view. So the top view is gonna be, you know, this these center ones here, you know, I have one through five. Um, and this is just me throwing out ideas on what, you know, what the client came to me with and kind of what I could do. And then, you know, from these top downs, I think they were like, I kind of like number five, but I also like the, you know, number four, the, that pattern. So maybe we can incorporate that somewhere. And so then I would do an isometric drawing, which was the last drawing that, that he had up there. 
And that one's going to show the ring from every angle, from the top down, from through the ring, you know, ev every okay. view. So I'm really thinking of a piece three dimensionally at this point. Um, but okay, to like, us, it's um, always here's the three dimensional the view of of the women's version that went with this one. Um, so you know, so you're getting you know each view from every side, so you really get a good idea of what it's going to look like in real life. It can sometimes be hard for the client to visualize exactly what a piece is going to look like. So by providing these drawings, they really can start to get a grasp on how their, their finished piece will look. And although this is clearly a drawing, you know, this is not the finished piece of jewelry, they can envision where the diamonds are, how the dragonfly is actually situated on the piece, the two-tone metals, and, you know, even the square shank at the bottom, they can really envision this entire piece and how it will look when it's done. Now, do you ever do these in CAD or are they always actual drawings? Uh, no, we are kind of, I mean, not against CAD, but we, we definitely don't use CAD in any of our, um, any of our work. We kind of feel like you lose the, the connection between like your hands and making something physically instead of just putting something into a computer and printing it out. Um, yeah, that yeah. handwork is really, um, a staple in our business and clients come to us specifically to have something handmade mm -hmm. and so we really love the idea of using traditional techniques and just you know not letting jewelry art transform into something that is completely done on a, on a computer so we like that hand uh, that handwork and so that's a staple in all of our pieces so you'll never see us use CAD <laughs> yeah. okay can we do you have a picture of the finished ring Hans? And there's the finished set. Yeah, so, you know, and if you go back to the last photo, that was the first one I was talking about with her ring. You know, she came up with these purple, she wanted a purple sapphire and dragonflies. And so I drew different drawings where I could put different dragonflies in there. And I think she really liked, it was a combination of one. I think this one actually took a few different drawings, but it was a combination of like number five and number eight. Number eight yeah and then you know sometimes you run into issues in this case we thought we would be going with a radiant cut stone so all of the center stones here they're rectangular um, unfortunately we weren't able to source and find a natural purple sapphire in the color saturation that she wanted and ended up needing to change the shape of the stone and so the final design we actually used a trillion so it altered the everything that we started thinking that we were going to uh, have at the beginning so sometimes, you know, you get thrown curveballs and you have to adapt and change yep. and kind of figure out solutions to the problems that arise. Yeah. Okay. And uh, do you have some of the other pictures that, that they have? Well, we've got a lot of pictures. Okay. <laughs> I guess we'll probably just go up to the beginning of them and you can work our way through. This one I know is recent. Yeah, yeah. Um, most recent uh, engagement ring that I did. It was actually for a client's uh, 25th anniversary. They wanted to redo their wedding sets. Um, so this was her ring and it's all platinum. I uh, hand carved it out of wax and then cast it and set all the stones by hand. Um, to start, I think I, I, you know, everything was solid. So where all the stones are, all that was just solid metal. And I first started by bezeling that center stone pretty deep down in there. So then I could cut in all the pave on top of that. And what's pretty cool about this design is that he's actually using two different styles of pave combined into one row. Um, yeah, so it combines about. bead and bright, which is going to be that that's this you know inner row here has that bright wall, and then the outer row has what's called castle or castell setting. Um, so this outer row up top here has the scoops on the side, and then it kind of switches to the to the bead and bright on the one side. So it's kind of a fun way to combine both of those setting styles. It's a it's a beautiful ring. I really like this oh, one. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> they loved it. So yeah, that's, that's the best thing. compliment I, we can get. It's when a client loves their piece. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I did too when you posted it. I was like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great reaction. We yeah. love it. Um, these are kind of more fun. Um, like our stock pieces that we like to do for shows and stuff. Um, we really like to do oxidized sterling silver mixed with the um, rich golds. So it kind of gives that nice contrast in color. And so what I'm doing here is I'll actually, 
all these panels here where you have the yellow sapphire rose and the little triangles and diamond shapes on the right hand side. I'll um, take a thin layer of gold and I'll use it to the silver. Um, so there's no solder in that. It's just you're heating up the two sheets of metal until they melt together. It's a very fine line of not melting everything and keeping it kind of like a solid sheet and having the two metals bond that way. And then what I'll do is I'll cut through all of the gold on the top and that's what's exposing the, the silver underneath. And so you get this dark undertone under your stones that really make everything pop bright colors. Yeah, so basically you're seeing the silver sheet underneath that is then oxidized and you're left with just the gold milgrain and gold prongs. And it's certainly a more labor intensive process, but we love the look so much that we find it's worth it to, to take that extra step to actually fuse the metal. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, color definitely plays a big role in our work when we're making stock pieces. So when Matt and I sit down and design out a bunch of pieces together and we'll go through all of our stones and actually lay, thing, lay out jobs for him to do. And we'll put together color combinations like this. In this case, we, you know, we're thinking of a men's and women's set. It doesn't necessarily have to be sold that way, but we love to give people the option to maybe see this as something that they might want to have with another person. Um, yeah. and definitely playing off of angles. So this, there's a lot of geometric shapes in our work, a lot of patterns and angles, and that's very well represented in this, mm -hmm. in these pieces. <laughs> yeah, a lot of textures too. I like your, I like your work for that as well. All of yeah. the geometry and then there's some organic and then you've got the whole textures thing going on. Yeah, yeah, gives a lot of layers to the work. Um, and even on the men's band here, so you can see all of those bright cuts um, and some of the polished lines. Well, Matt will intentionally keep some areas dark, add texture to others, and it really, as the piece wears, the oxidation doesn't stay this rich black forever. Depending on how the person wears the piece and the acidity in their hands, it will start to wear like a fine leather, it breaks in. And so you'll get this even, kind of breaks in uniquely to the wearer so yeah. it depends on how the person wears the ring is it's going to kind of show those signs of wear unique to the wearer so it's kind of cool to see how everybody wears their rings different how they change colors and change over time as they're wearing them yeah deeper parts will remain darker exposed areas on top will get polished back so it, it definitely is interesting to see um, how it changes I'll come back to the screen share in a minute. I'm just trying to get the order straight. Okay. Do we have any questions? Uh, I think there's also, well, uh, people have, also can be asking questions at the same time. Yeah, I'm looking at this cool. translation from the people from the people who are commenting and the, the gentleman is from Brazil. And ah. I was hoping that there is some way that he could learn more because he's having difficulty learning in Brazil. Ah, did you hear that? We have somebody <laughs> watching from Brazil. That's awesome. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Um, I mean, that, that nowadays, YouTube videos, you can learn a lot from them. I know a lot of people are going to the online schooling. I haven't personally done any of that. I know a lot of the learning I've done is through workshops, going to GRS, taking private instruction, th things like that nature. I'm not really sure what the resources are in Brazil. Um, my first bet would be get online and try to get on some of those online classes and YouTube videos, things like that. Yeah. And, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of people that are really skilled, if you did reach out to them directly and perhaps inquire about online instruction, people might be willing to offer online classes one-on-one -on -one these days. So you just never know, you could reach out to somebody that uh, you really want to talk to and they might be willing to do a personalized class for you. Yeah. Do you, do you guys, uh, teach at all do you have students or um yeah we've been starting to teach some we do a little bit of private instruction so far it's just been stone setting and we've done some basic engraving teaching um we're also teaching a stone setting class at a local um uh, metal smithing school here in boulder colorado uh it's called boma boulder metal smithing association i believe it's in june right june 7th june, i think yeah june 7th and we'll be teaching like the castle pave on a, just a straight band. So something pretty simple. Um, it is our goal okay. to eventually be teaching more like one-on-one -on -one in studio. Um, it's just, yeah, right now the COVID stuff has put a little damper on that, and, <laughs> you know? Yes, yes <laughs> so, a damper on lots. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, this was a, a really fun ring that we made for Art Basel last year in Miami. Um, the center stone was cut by Trebly Ghana, Anna, um, good friend of ours. And the center stone kind of inspired the whole design. The theme kind of was peacock. Um, so I, I reached out to her and she cut me this awesome sapphire that um, is in a peacock shape. And so I kind of built off of that and all of the other stones around it are colored diamonds. Um, and then the baguettes are the white ones there in the center. And it's just a really fun, fun, playful design. So. And Matt fully hand fabricated this. And I believe even the metal, um, he started with 24 karat and alloyed it down to 14 karat in order to be able to use. So all of this, you know, truly was made by hand, um, which, yeah, makes it all that much more amazing. Yeah. <laughs> nice picture. picture. <laughs> uh, these ones were fun. This one actually was a combination of both mine and Lauren's work. Um, I fabricated the band. So with this one, I actually had to lay out a strip of rose gold and then I cut all of the white section out of the rose sheet. And then I basically cut the other section of white out of another sheet and fit them together so that I could solder them all together. And I'll tell you, that was certainly a pain to get everything to fit together <laughs> properly. Um, but I think it was, was worth it. You get the three tones of color there. Um, and then Lauren actually did all the hand engraving on the mountains. And he forgot to say yeah. that the, the um, half dome, so this is Yosemite, half dome there and the sun were actually inlaid in 24 karat yellow gold. So you have three different gold tones here. And so it was kind of like a metal puzzle for Matt to put together. And then um, at the end, I engraved the mountains in order to really bring this scene to life. And so this was actually a custom commission to wedding bands. And um, it's just really, you never know what people are gonna ask for and um, how you might be able to help guide this. They started with a very different idea of what they wanted and we ended up with these amazing rings that you're just not gonna see anywhere else. Um, and there's multiple textures going on in this set as well. And you can't see it as well around the back, but there's, I think, three different textures that you'll find on this, on this set. So in person, it just has this great sparkle and look about them. This one has actually stemmed quite a few mountain things from us. It was very popular for us. Yeah. So a lot of people have been reaching out now for different mountain scenes. So, you know, we can do yeah. any oh, mountain Matt. scene, really. Yeah. Matt, um, you have to just be a little bit closer, I guess, because I gotcha. uh, we're, we're, having, we're having a hard time <laughs> picking up. Okay, yeah. yeah, when you just, when you lean in, we can hear. Or I guess, Yeah, I was, oh, I was okay. just saying that these ones were, were very popular for us and that we've had a lot of people been reaching out for different mountain scenes that are more sentimental to them. Um, yeah. So they're fun because they can be sentimental to the to the wearer as well. And we can customize them anyway. Yeah. So this piece honestly was just a fun, funky, I drew a shape on a piece of paper and <laughs> Matt went with it. Um, we had this center, all of this is diamond. So this piece is all diamonds, all different color ranges um, from whites to champagne, to yellows, to browns with this fancy orange natural diamond in the center. Um, and yeah, we had been sitting on that center stone for a really long time, started trying to think about what we wanted to do for some new work and um yeah we call it our power ring because it reminds us of like the little comic book pow. Pow symbol. <laughs> uh, yeah <laughs> <Well>. <laughs> and um yeah I mean Matt just really had fun paving the entire surface of this ring yeah and again this is a fully hand fabricated piece so every single part that you see here he formed and rolled out and made wire for and all done by hand. This one is a fun one. It's, uh, so it's all white gold. And the cool thing about this one is that center section that you can see is a little different color than the outer section. Um, it actually spins. So the whole center section will spin between those two rails. Um, and the pattern also goes all the way around. So you have two of the Celtic knot one on either side, opposing side, and then you have two rows of diamonds on either side as well. So that's fun. It's, you know, when things are mechanical like that, where they have to spin and move, it, it's quite a bit more challenging. You got to be pretty precise on 
how everything fits together. If your circles aren't perfectly round, then, you know, it might move really well for 75% of the turn, but then, you know, another 25%, something's out of round, it's not going to spin right. It sticks. It or... sticks. So a lot of times we like to, to introduce movement to our pieces and, you know, it, it adds that extra challenge and kind of problems that you got to figure out to overcome. Yeah. Matt ended up needing to use a lathe to get those circles perfectly round. So, you know, there's just no shortage of tools that you may need <laughs> and ways to, <laughs> ways to keep things uh, as precise and perfect as possible, especially when you have movement. Yeah, I, I liked it. And then Matt told me it's spun. And then I was like, ooh. <laughs> yeah. really that, was a, that was a piece for a friend. And he said, I really, I like to fidget a lot. I like to be doing things with my hands. So I really want a ring that I can sit there and play with all day. <laughs> Uh, this okay. one was a really fun project that I did. Um, um, can you, it, yeah, we're having a, trouble. You, yeah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> it's a, this one is, I made it as a pinky ring. So it's, you know, pretty small men's ring. And the whole thing is the base of it is sterling silver. Um, so I um, inlaid these triangles of gold on the top. And then this was actually right after I took a class in Kansas um, with Ben. Uh, it was just specialty pave class, so I wanted to come back and just pave something out. <laughs> and so this is uh, kind of a passion project that I did like on the side. It took me close to a year, I would say. No, maybe, not quite that long, but definitely long, months. Yeah, a long time. Months of um, indecisiveness on where to put stones yeah, and how he wanted to finish it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, so I'm glad to hear. I'm glad to hear there are other people that have these issues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so they are all diamonds except for these little yellow guys on the side. Those are the only sapphires. Um, so the tops are orange diamonds and then the row around is black diamonds and then you have some more orange on the side and white ones and then black ones. Um, but you know this is again goes back to us liking that contrast of the darkened silver with the rich golds. Um, you know all of uh, you see the inside here, all that is a gold vermeil. So we'll we'll plate the inside of the ring and these bright cuts on the side here, these are all gold vermeil as well. So they're plated in there. And you know, we'll use gold vermeil or plating in recessed areas where it's gonna stay. It's not gonna take any wear. It's always gonna be in there. Um, you know, and then these other areas where they're level with the surface of the ring where they are gonna take wear and it's gonna hit. Well, that's solid 24 karat that's inlaid in there. So I'll be able to clean that up and, you know, spruce it up and make it look like new for its entire life. We definitely think about the wearability of our pieces and um, being able to wear them for a long time. So, yeah. you know, we often tell our clients that uh, we really are thinking about the piece outliving them for generations. We want to make jewelry that's meant to stand the test of time and something that you can really um, pass down. Pass down. Yeah. Nice. Let me, let me reset this again. It's giving me trouble changing back and forth. Oh, the pictures are giving him trouble. Give him a second for the moving the, the pictures around. Guys, I really have enjoyed this, but I hear a baby that needs me. So yeah, gonna <laughs> I'm going to have well, to go, but Matt's going to continue on. Thank you so much. <laughs> thanks for, the, for coming. <laughs> yeah. More, more important things. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been interesting trying to figure out the flow of getting work done and taking care of the baby and all that. So, you know, still figuring it out. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, this one was a really fun one. Um, you know, since I do fabricate a lot, I'm able to mix metals a lot. So this one has a really cool rose gold undertone and you know rose gold insert that I put in between the two rows of diamond there. Um, just a unique kind of, it's actually pretty flashy from the side too, as well from the top. So we're trying to think all the way around when we're designing a ring and kind of make it unique everywhere really. So yeah, this was another fun one too. Um, I actually discovered this kind of inside ring stuff after I took a class with Jeff Park. Uh, I just, you know, got the idea. I want to be able to do this stuff like inside a ring, kind of like a little hidden secret for um, for the wearer to decide who they want to show it to. 
Um, a lot of people tell me I'm crazy and they're like, why would you do all that detail on the inside of the ring? No one's ever going to see it. It's, you know, that's kind of the point is that where can choose who they want to show it to. And it's, you know, kind of their own special hidden secret in there. So uh, we have a few other scenes that we're coming out with here shortly um, that are going to be pretty cool. And then hurrying to um, all the components, you know, again, I like to do that multi-tone metal. Um, so hers was, uh, she had her grandma's center stone that she wanted to use at sentimental to her. And, you know, we came up with this kind of art deco design for hers. Another one in the mountain series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> mountain stuff is popular and it's fun to do, so. So that's, that's the end of the pictures? Okay. All right, yeah, we can do a shop tour. And then I have a bunch of um, quick questions just to see uh, okay. that I sent you. So we can do those. So um, cool. do you want, do you want to tour. do the shop tour first or? Sure, yeah. yeah. All right, so let's start on this side here. Got, you know, very exciting sink, very dirty. Um, it's a working oh, sink. It's a good thing. Yeah, yeah, yes, a working sink. And then we have, uh, you know, this little pin tumbler that I use. Um, this is our son's future bench or our student bench, one of the two. <laughs> Pretty basic setup here. Then we have polishing unit with my cleaning machine and steam cleaner. Uh, and then just storage stuff down there. So we got the laser welder and the rolling mill. Um, and over here for the sharp engravers. I keep um I like to modify a lot of my stuff to make it just more functional and area of the store work better. So you know these are big printer drawers come from printer presses and stuff. And so you can pick them up at antique stores. So I made a little drawer out of it to hold all my braces and all my graver blanks. That's a great idea. Yeah. Um, this little soldering station right here. Uh, I also do electroplating up there. Um, made my own fume hood here too. I bought a fume hood off Craigslist and when we got it down here, the thing was so tall, it you know, it came down to my chest. So I had to have a friend use a laser cutter and a plasma cutter, not a laser cutter. And we cut it in half, <laughs> turned it into a, a nice exhaust hood. And then we do full casting here too. So the burnout kiln, vacuum caster, electro melt. Um, we'll, they use uh, natural gas and oxygen. So I have a little gas booster down there. All my forming stuff is over here. So I have, well, this is actually how I pour all my metal. So these are all my frames that I use to pour metal into when I melt it down. Uh, some forming stuff here, more stakes and forming things. You know, it, I, I think your finger is a little on the, there. yeah, you're, uh, where you're holding, where the camera is. Sorry. There you go, thanks. Yeah, stakes, bezel blocks. So I like forming equipment. And then my actual forming I do right here on this little table. It's just like a steel sturdy table that was built. Um, you know, this little insert thing, I can put all the little stakes in it that I have down there. They're just different forms to hammer different metal on to get different shapes. All my hammers, I have a, this is actually an Ikea towel rack that I converted into a hammer rack. Uh, here's my bench where I spend most of my time. Where the magic you know, happens. Yeah, you know, so I'm using pole scraper. I have the S9i. Um, my bench is from a company called Auto Fry. They make like awesome sturdy benches that'll last you a lifetime. Uh, mine's a double bank, so it's got rows oh, rose on this side. And then a row on this side. Um, lately, I've been mostly using the pole scraper. I also do have the GRS machine down in here. Um, 
Let's see, what else can I show you on here? My sea of gravers. I have a ton of gravers here. Um, I did modify the, my pan. What's that? Yeah, what is the white, the white part on the top of your pan? What is the material? Yeah, okay, so it's for mica. And this I modified. So I can show you that I can change it here. Move all this stuff off there. So I made a, a formica top and I like a stone setting platform so I can really support my arms when I'm setting. And this thing actually slides out so I can sweep all my all my lemel and all that into the, the thing down there. And if I want to fabricate, I can actually take this thing off completely. And I have like a regular jeweler's pan underneath it. So it kind of Eventually, I'd like to have a, a dedicated setting bench and a dedicated fabricating bench, but I, I don't have enough space right now. So I had to modify this to work for both. Um, and we'll keep going around. Over here, we have the wax bench. This is where I carve waxes at. You can actually see the design for the last one that I just carved right here. Um, I like this type of bench for waxes because it has like a double drawer. It has a drawer on the top so you can keep all your tools in. And then when you're working, you can close it so you don't get a bunch of wax in there. And you have a bottom one that can actually catch all the wax and all the filings because carving waxes can get pretty dirty and there can be wax flying everywhere. Um, this is, you know, Lauren works here a lot of the time at the computer doing admin stuff, fun stuff, I'll tell you what. And then uh, her, her bench is over here. So she has the single bank auto fry bench. It just has the one, one set of drawers there. And she, you know, mostly just does engraving. So she'll, she's been working on a turntable. And you guys face each other, right? The benches face each mm -hmm. other? Yep. So I like this setup just because then I can have an island in the center. So you can put a bunch of like commonly used tools on this island area. And then either person on either bench can kind of reach up and grab things that they need to use. And then it also creates like a great little storage area in the center where you can put stuff down in there like compressors, things like that. Um, yeah, then let's see over here we have got a little shear, ring stretcher, more storage. I think that's pretty much nice. the majority of the shop. Yeah. Well, I, I always find it fascinating to see how other people lay out their tools because, you know, most of the tools are common to people, right? You know, hammers and pliers and things. And, but it's always interesting to see how people modify them or use them or yeah. come up with different combinations, tips and tricks. It's very cool. Yeah. And then, I think that's a lot of with the jewelry industry is a lot of stuff you have to modify things like a lot of times with engraving you're you're working on a flat surface or maybe a curved surface but there's not things sticking up out in the way like a lot of times with jewelry you got bezels sticking up or you got a, like a ledge sticking up so I, I do a lot of modifying tools making tools making things maybe I'll make a graver just do two cuts on a job that'll take me longer to make the graver than it will to actually use it <laughs> But, you know, with jewelry, there's a lot of stuff in the way that you got to kind of overcome. So. Okay. Well, cool. I have, a, I have some questions for you. Um, we've been doing a bunch of these interviews, and I heard from uh, somebody who's been watching a lot of them named Mark, and he said it would be great if we came up with a set of questions to ask all of the people that we're interviewing. So this yeah. is on his, his idea. Um, and uh, I think I, I already sent them to you, but um, what, what age did you start getting into jewelry? Yeah, um, I was fortunate and I started in high school. So I was freshman year of high school, they had a jewelry program and I was hooked ever since I started. Um, I took it all four years through high school and I went to college to do jewelry as well. And I was honestly a little, little bummed out with the college program since I had spent all of high school doing fine arts classes. I did drawing, painting, ceramics, photography, pretty much any kind of art class you could think of, I, I was taking it. 
And so by the time I got to college, you had to do all these prereqs of drawing, painting, and all this stuff that I'd already spent four years of high school doing. And so I got very bored with the program. You had to do all, all of these things before you could even take a jewelry class. And so then I, I finally got through all those classes and got to my first jewelry class. And in college, it was kind of like the same thing as I was doing in high school. So I got a little frustrated with it. And at that point, I actually stopped doing the college thing and I went and decided it was better for me to work in the industry and get a job working in the field and so from 2009 to when did I 2015 ish 16 ish I was working for other jewelry designers and, and jewelers and stuff so that's kind of how I got into it yeah excellent so um whose work do you admire Oh man. <laughs> well, um, there's probably a lot I mean, of people, but yeah, there's a lot of people. And it was really interesting is when I was first getting into jewelry, there was no one my age. It was everybody was older than me. Um, there was literally no one that was my age. And now I feel like there's this big renaissance in jewelry and there's a ton of people I know that are my age and everybody's putting out really cool work that I'm just like, just constantly inspired by a lot of people. Um, some, you know, just to name someone, I, Jason Fava's stuff is just mind blowing. Every time I see his work, I'm blown away. Um, engraver wise, I, I really like Jeff's stuff. Um, Jeff Park, I mean, there's a ton. Sam Alfano, his stuff's amazing as well. Um, there's just so many to list that I could sit here all day listing people off. Okay. Um, are you a daytime or nighttime jeweler? Well, when I used to be, your work. I used to be like daytime. And then if I get sucked into something, I'll, I'll work as late as I, my eyes can handle it pretty much. Um, but lately it's any time that I can with the little one. <laughs> so it's just, you know, anytime I can, but most of the time I'm down here during the day and working kind of till eight or nine at night, probably starting around hopefully nine sometimes a little later <laughs> okay so, what i do i do work a lot <laughs> what do you listen to when you're working do you have well, any particular music yeah i yeah we are uh deep house fans so you know the ajuna deep you probably don't know what that means but it's all all house music techno music that kind of stuff so we'll we'll listen to soundcloud a lot we'll listen to like hour two hour mixes where it'll just you know a dj will be spinning music for for two hours something that doesn't stop so that you can get into a nice workflow and yeah I, I really just don't like it when the song's changing every every seven minutes or so five seven minutes so okay <laughs> yeah we don't really do podcasts um, or anything but i've been i've been thinking about it looking into that but mostly just music and, and this is this the next question is one that everybody seems to always ask. So I'm going to ask it. What is the geometry of your favorite tool? <laughs> um, I don't have a favorite tool. I mean, I'm I'm such such a tool junkie that I'll you know I'll make tons of gravers. I have so many different gravers. If I had to pick one, probably would be like a 120. It was, was my, my go-to graver when I was first starting out, just engraving would be a flat and a 120. Um, now I would say I use maybe a 105, slightly more than a 120. I just like that it cuts slightly deeper for jewelry stuff. Um, but I, I, yeah, I like to make all different types of gravers, punches, you know, you name it. <laughs> it's really hard for me to pick one, I would say. Okay. Yeah. Um, what is the most difficult thing you ever had to make? Whether that be setting, fabricating, what, what is the hardest project you've had to date? Um, hardest project to date. I mean, that's a tough one because it, it really depends on the day. You could have one thing that's fighting you like none other, and then you go and you do the same thing the next day and it's super easy. So I just... <laughs> It, it just really depends, I guess, kind of on like how you're working at that day. But I mean, I've, I've set some really expensive emeralds and made some really expensive pieces when I worked at Todd Reed and stuff that have quite a bit of movement and stuff like that, kind of technical. Anything with movement, I would say, is, is a little, little more difficult. Harder, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
What is the favorite thing, the favorite piece that you've ever made? Uh, I think honestly, my favorite pieces that I get to make are just when I get to have fun and, and make something with no really design in mind. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff that we make in for a client, we come up with an idea or a design and then you got to kind of stick to that idea deliver with that idea. You can't really be like, oh, well, I think this is going to look better while you're going through it. So like those projects, when I have more freedom to do kind of whatever I want, I think that's, that's what I enjoy the most. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, what is your favorite snack or beverage <laughs> when you're working? Uh, like, are you constantly drinking Coke or popping yeah, M&M's? But, or? <laughs> uh, as, as lame as it sounds, it's probably water or like sparkling water. I have a, a big old water bottle that I keep here. So I try to stay hydrated. Um, I usually don't eat too much, um, while I'm working. I don't know just never really have <laughs> usually if I go and it'll be like scarfing food down and get we get right back to work it's not really eating while working but yeah you know, I mean okay. sometimes I'll have a monster energy drink but <laughs> depends how tired I am <laughs> only, only at only at nine at night right yeah yeah <laughs> and if you had the last question is um if you had one piece of advice to give to somebody who wanted to get into this profession, what would that be? Uh, yeah, probably take your time and, and focus on the basics. I see a lot of people that get way ahead of themselves and they're doing pave settings, but then they, you know, have never heard of a sanding stick or they've never heard of, you know, they can't do a bezel or something that's super basic. So really get those fundamentals solid. Um, it's it's going to translate to everything that you do and make everything easier. And if you start with the basics first and, and really drill those, then it's you're going to progress faster and you're not going to learn things wrong and have to relearn things. So that, that, that would be my advice. And get some solid training. If you can work in the industry, do it before just trying to jump out and do your own thing. But learn off of someone else's dime because you're going to make mistakes. That's the only way to learn. Okay. Oh, well, thank you very much for, uh, I know it's, a, it's disruptive, especially with the, uh, the new baby and all. Um, oh, yeah, no worries. Okay. And um, I know that uh, you recently got the pulse graver. Did you, do mm -hmm. you have any uh, feedback on that at all? Um, yeah, I would just say, or? yeah, I've been really liking it. Um, at first, I was having a little issue with it. It's just because I, I was having the power up way too high. And, you know, I was thinking, like, I just want the power up to see how fast I can remove metal and cut. And once I actually started dialing in the settings a little bit more, it's pretty amazing at how much you can fine tune the machine and get it to do exactly what you want. Um, yeah, I mean, I... I I really like it. I like the, the hammer setting. So, you know, it's got like, works like the inset as well as some of the other machines. And so it's, it's definitely got a lot of power to it. And so I've been, been really liking it for hammering, um, bright cutting deeply, quickly. Um, it's, yeah, so nice not to have to turn on the air compressor, you know, all, all those things is really convenient about it. <laughs> so. It does, it does cut up, uh, cut out a lot of noise. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's super, super quiet. And it's just, it's always there and ready to go. You just gotta, you know, mine's hooked up to my lights. And when I turn on the power strip, everything turns on and all I gotta do is grab it and start going. So it's, it's been nice, yeah. Well, good, I'm, I'm glad that's working for you. Yeah. Okay, and if, um, if someone wants to get in touch with you or Lauren, uh, what is your Instagram, email, website yeah, whatever um, it is that you'd like to to share yeah our instagram is toggle designs um you can certainly send a message through there um we we get a lot of messages through there so sometimes we do miss them i think the best place is to shoot us an email at info at toggle designs.com and the, you know that's the best way if you want a custom piece from us you can go onto our website toggle designs.com and we have a custom intake form that you can fill out and that's kind of how we get get the whole process started All right. And if you want to get in touch with me, it's uh, Tira at engraver.com, uh, Tira.Mitchell on Instagram or 
pulse graver. I think that's it, right? No, no other? There's, I'm, I'm easy to get a hold of. My phone number is on the site as well. So, yeah. Well, thank you very much for spending some time yeah. and showing us your, your shop. Um, yeah, thanks say, for having me. Thank you. Say thank you to Lauren and uh, yeah, well. stay safe and 